Landscape Seminar Series. Um, we have the pleasure of having with us today Daniel, Daniel Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer sorry. Daniel is a postdoc researcher exploring the challenges in hydrology and landscape evolution. And today he'll be sharing some insights on mobile, mobile wind gasps as a dominant mechanism for drainage reversal. Um, just this, this seminar will be moderated by me and by Luke and Boris. And a quick reminder that the talk will last for more or less 40, 45 minutes, and that will be recorded. The chat will be open for questions by the end of the talk, so you can pose your question directly or you can unmute yourself. Um, first of all, I would like to express my thanks for Daniel's participation. And I think we can start. Daniel, the stage is yours. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Daniel. I'm a Brazilian geomorphologist. And I am super happy to be here. And um, today, I will kind of allow myself to be just a young geomorphologist intrigued by the landscapes out there and trying to understand how they come to be as we observe them. So today, I will introduce you to my hypothesis of how landscapes evolve after a lateral capture occurs. I know this is not fully resolved, but I really hope that you find this interesting and that you are inspired to start chatting about perhaps a, a fresh perspective on river channel uh, reorganization. So I start asking a simple question. How do landscapes evolve in the aftermath of a lateral capture event? Most, most geomorphologists would um, say something that is depicted in this picture. So we have a sketch showing a landscape in time one, and then this same landscape in time two. We have a blue river that is kind of flat, and we have a, a, a red river that is a little bit more steeper, uh, erodes faster then, and that in, at time two intercepts laterally the stream in blue at point E, and this creates uh, base level lowering in all the captured uh, system upstream of point E. And most geomorphologists would be concentrated on this effect and the migration of this base level lowering, because this is where all the changes happen in the aftermath of, of a river capture. I am, however, in this talk, a little bit more interested in the other side, in the side where we have a wind gap and this wind gap is basically uh, the old river channel bed that is now positioned in a topographic context of a drainage divide. And we have a beheaded stream downstream. And I was especially intrigued, inspired by, uh, by fieldwork examples, such as this one in China, where we have a captured stream, and then we have the inflection and the change of direction and flow. We have a beheaded stream. We have the capture point here, and we also have, um, so basically we have a, a large offset between the position of the original capture point and where the, the drainage divide is now. And I was intrigued uh, about that. Here is another example. This is the Wutak River Systems. You guys heard all about this in Wolfgang Schoen's hard talk. So we have a similar story. We have the capture stream, um, we have the capture point, we have to the other side, the beheaded stream, and we have the revested stream. And basically, uh, this is the Feldberg area, and this used to be the headwaters of the Danube river system until the Wutak captured laterally the system. So I will just zoom in into this area, and we can see here that basically what we have is we have the, the capture point, we have a low elevation drainage divide, which we call a wind gap or an invalid drainage divide, where it is lower and it is flanked on both sides by higher elevation uh, drainage divides. We have the beheaded bridge to one side and we have the revested bridge flowing to the other side. Um, if we are to look um, across divide um, differences in morphology between the revested side and the beheaded side, we would see that nearby in the vicinity of the, the, the wind gap, we have a, a flat morphology 
and that uh, downstream we have a transition into a more steeper area marked by the knee point, uh, whereas in the behead stream, it's basically flat. This is a special kind of, of river capture, as Wolfgang told us, because we have a, a constraint on age. This, this capture occurred around 20,000 uh, years ago, and the wind gap is now located around 4.5 kilometers upstream. So I was intrigued by that. How did, how did this reversal occur? If we look into the literature, the most common way to try and explain um, drainage reversal is through tectonic tilting, something depicted here between what changed in the headwaters of this system from time one to time two. But this is, uh, is, is actually really difficult to explain this phenomenon using this hypothesis because uh, in the trunk stream, flow is reversed, but the Barbie tributaries flow is not reversed. And at the same time, when you have a reversal, the antecedent drainage pathway is at least partially um, preserved. So it's really difficult to think in a rock uplift field capable of uh, inverting only the trunk stream, but not the, the, the tributaries. And that applies in many different settings. Uh, However, uh, Ethan Schleff and Little Gordon uh, presented an alternative uh, explanation uh, where they called something on the lines of a long valley divide mobility schematics, where uh, this wind gap, which I just showed to you, would be the responsible for the reversal of, of the river as it moves from time one to time two. It captured all this area, and we can see that the, the trunk stream is reversed while the Barbet's, uh, Barbet tributary still keeps its antecedent flow pathway. However, um, it's really difficult to understand how that could be the case, because if we look back at the wood duck, uh, we can see that the, the nick point is exactly at this point, and the wind gap is, is more upstream or downstream if we look to the beheaded side. So it did not yet experience it, uh, the base level fall that have happened in here. So how can this be moving at that velocity? And so I can come to this kind of conceptual representation of what I, what I believe was uh, sort of what was going on. So we have the interception lateral by the capture reach, and then we have the wind gap formed in the vicinity of the capture point. And something representing how we are seeing today um, where this wind gap is offset from the, the original position of it. You have barbed tributaries, you have the, the, uh, the formation of nick points that migrated upstream and in each one of the tributaries, uh, and you have the reverse stream. But I did not know at that point then, how can we come from two to time three? So what I did here, and I'm going to to convey to you is I started to explore some 2D landscape evolution model simulations where I will force in an initially steady state river channel that is flowing towards north in this case, I will create a escarpment north-south in a way that uh, I will open flow to this side, to the left side, in a way that I will create a transients that will uh, move to the right side. And eventually it will intercept laterally the systems. And I want to document um, how the system evolves. So from now on, uh, I will present my hypothesis using a specific uh, model run, which will be able to convey uh, the feedbacks that I, I believe are involved in post-capture landscape evolution. And I will then detail insights extracted uh, from how the reversed system, the beheaded system, and the, the captured system are evolving through time. Um, one thing that is really cool is that I did not have to add any other process to it. It is just same mode, same mode, uh, stream power model, and use slope diffusivity. And still, as we'll see, we get to some counterintuitive results. OK, so I'll start showing a synthetic model run where you see everything I'm going to speak about. 
I'm not going to say too much because I am going gonna go after that, explaining what happens with the capture stream and so on, all the, the different systems. So, but I want to say that I have here marked the antecedent real stream, and I will create a escarpment north south. This will start to move to the right, and the, uh, at this point where I am showing, we'll have a, a capture, and then we'll see how the system evolves from there. So now we have the capture, we have the wind gap market as the, the, the yellow point, and we see uh, the movement of the wind gap, which is conquering uh, tributaries to the beheaded reach and is growing up. And we can see at each capture, we have a base level fall event and the wind gap is racing ahead of the other drainage divides until the moment where it loses the competition to a competing other stream network that is more downstream. Which will then uh, make base level fall, and this will equilibrate and will stop moving. Okay, so just from this initial setup, which you, you guys already saw, I will already give you some key insights, and then we will discuss a little bit. And here I am showing the left figure just how the beheaded system look at just when the capture has happened. And this is when the wind gap was stopped because of base level fall in these other tributaries. So basically what we saw was that this wind gap, the movement of the wind gap led the edge of river flow reversal in areas that were formerly of the beheaded ridge. And we also saw, and we can observe that this movement uh, was directed along the, the valley of the antecedent river pathway. Also, as the wind gap is moving through, it is capturing lateral tributaries through the beheaded river and creating nick points in each one of these. We can see here in the right side that at least the trunk streams of the behead of the Barbie tributaries uh, can keep their, their uh, same orientation as before by the end of the model run. And I, I also want to mention that the wind gap, this movement of the wind gap and this conquering of different areas may put together or stitch together um, river drainages or drainage lines that used to flow through different systems, creating um, some very weird uh, looking patterns uh, similar to those that we observe in the field. And that the, the migration of the, the, the wind gap can be stopped at any point. So now off to the, the, the insights. I will start looking at each one of the, the systems to describe, describe what, and then I will give you my explanation of why this happens. First, the, the captured stream. So we are just before the capture. We have the capture. We created the beheaded stream. We created the, 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 the wind gap. And we also created base, basically the point of capture increases its drainage area instantaneously. This leads to, this amplifies local erosion rates, creating a nick point. This nick point then proceeds to migrate upstream. And each time it encounters a tributary, it also lowers the base level of these tributaries, creating new nick points that then migrates upstream. Uh, it's interesting to mention that as these nick points migrate to the left, they, they uh, balance out the escarpment that was uh, moving towards the right side and the escarpment will stop. At the same time, as it reaches the, the right side, the right side becomes um, kind of a escarpment and it starts to move inside for the beheaded side and including uh, the reversed side. So for instance, in here we see the capture of one of these uh, tributaries to the, the captured system that just captured another stream that was to the reverse. But the reverse also captured to the, the side of the, uh, the, barbed, the beheaded river. And this created nick points that will migrate upstream and ultimately will balance out. And this will stop migrating. OK, so it's kind of the same old, same old. OK, now to the beheaded system. Here, the fun starts.
So <clears throat> before the capture, this beheaded system was equilibrated to the background of lake rate. So everywhere along the river was eroding at the same rate. Immediately after the capture occurred, uh, this river, this beheaded river, because it lost all this upstream drainage area, doesn't have an upstream power to erode at the same uh, rate as the background of lake rate. So what happens is um, you have a sudden decrease of erosion rates in its upper part, and it basically stops eroding. So now we are looking at erosion rates. And I created a, a, a different uh, scale of co colors such that we can see what I want to show. Uh, in here, so the background uh, erosion rates is 10 meters per million year. And everything that we see in blue here is eroding at the background of lake rate. So in steady state. What is in yellow is slightly below uh, the steady state rate. And what is what will be shown as black is something that is almost zero, almost nothing. And we can see already before the capture that we have this kind of blurred shadows in yellow. And these blurred shadows in yellow are showing basically that uh, as the escarpment is migrating progressively to the right, um, these systems in the plateau are losing area gradually. And because of that, they are eroding um, slower than the background of lip rate. However, at just the moment when we have the capture, The beheaded stream, <clears throat> because it lost instantaneously a very large area, um, along the line of the antecedent stream, it starts eroding at nearly uh, zero meters per million year at the channel head. And this effect uh, decreases as you go downstream the antecedent river network. If we go further in time, we'll see that um, this effect will gradually spread first downstream and then laterally to all the, the, the tributaries of the, uh, of the beheaded uh, system. If we go a little bit further in time, so this is for the first big capture, right? Now I, I'm going, as we saw, the, the wind gap is moving through and capturing tributaries to the beheaded side. And I will show uh, just before one of these new captures that will happen in the future. Okay, this is just before the capture. We still have this blurry yellowish uh, color showing basically gradual migration of the drainage divides and loss of the area of the plateau side. And then we have a capture of one of these uh, side tributaries. At this very moment, we create again the same, uh, the, the, the same effect. So you have a reinforced effect. And this implies among other things that the way that the, the, the wind gap um, moves through the system is a little bit different than I thought uh, in the beginning, in the sense that uh, what does happen is the wind gap is the one that intercepts uh, the, the, the river that was captured. And as they do so, they lower the base level of this river, they become the nick point. And because of that, they, a new wind gap is formed. And this new wind gap that is formed uh, is here marked by this, this uh, blackish line, colors. Okay, just to show a little bit longer after the capture that this will dissipate or spread and becomes a little bit blurry. But you can see that just after the capture, it is really concentrated along the line of the antecedent stream. So I can say that basically immediately after the capture we'll have this uh, really uh, steep decrease in, in channel in erosion rates at the channel head of the beheaded system. And this, the first thing, it, it instantly amplified the crosswind gap difference in erosion rates in the very moment. And this obviously will facilitate the, the divide mobility along the beheaded valley. Okay, the second thing is if the wind gap is not moving fast enough because the upper part of the beheaded system is eroding uh, slower than the uplift. As time goes by, this upper part will become steeper. So we'll have a steepening. And this steepening is an equal. It is um, uh, higher at the upper part of the beheaded river than its 
in its downstream part. And the result of this is that you have a, a downward spreading base level rise. And as this downward spreading base level rise uh, elevates the base level of these side tributaries, all these side tributaries will also um, respond to the base level rise. So I just want to show you how this, this looks like. You can see that my y-axis is, is pretty small. So this will be amplified, let's say. But in reality, when compared to the reverse, this is basically flat. But we can see already, this is immediately after the capture. And we can see that the trunk behind the stream is already much uh, flatter than the, the tributaries. OK, as time goes by and the wind gap is moving through, we can see that it becomes to, to steepen and that the steepening is not linear along the entire length. We can see that in the, its upper part, the steepening uh, is, is uh, higher. So it is steepen, 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 steepen. It's really steepen now that, that is, uh, the wind gap is getting closer to this large uh, tributary to the beheaded river which indicates among other stuff that the wind gap is slowing down in its velocity, in its mobility. So it's really steepening. And then the capture will occur. Oops. And then the capture, oh, I didn't show. But the capture occurs and, and, and this um, tendency stops basically. So we had something like that. And then when the capture occurs, we have the other way around. So if I were to give you some insights, I would say, the degree of steepening of the beheaded river will depend on the velocity of the migration of this wind gap, which I don't know if I should call wind gap or valley uh, drainage divide. And that at each one of these captures, uh, you, you will reinforce the reduction in erosion rates in the upper part of the beheaded river. And each new capture, you cause a new base level rise event and that this new base level, each one of these base level uh, uh, rise events uh, will then make this, the, the other beheaded tributaries that are yet to be captured even more vulnerable. And it's also important to say that all these processes are related to the size, the drainage area of the beheaded uh, tributaries. Okay, so now to the reverse system. And I'll give you my explanation of why this happens and why the progressive reversal and this mobility of the wind gap. This is the result of the combination of three different things. The first one is the base level fall. Uh, the base level fall at the point of capture creates relief between the wind gap that is located as a drainage divide and, and the, the, the capture point. This creates relief, obviously. At the same time, immediately after the capture event, you have the drastic reduction in erosion rates at the upper part of the beheaded, uh, beheaded river, which creates or amplifies the across wind gap differences in erosion rates. Yet, um, if, we, if we remember from the model, um, the neat points in the, the capture, uh, the capture system migrates much faster than the, the migration of the wind gap in the beginning. One of the reasons for that is because in this very initial moment, you basically don't have almost no drainage area. Okay, and the third part, which took me some time before I, I actually figured it out, is that actually the flat morphology of the upper parts of the reversed and beheaded ridge is really important to make the wind gap move faster because they amplify the horizontal divide movement for giving across divide contrast in erosion. Okay, I will show you that. Now we'll see the same thing, but I will point out um, both the morphology of the reversed and the beheaded ridge. And I am also measuring the velocity of the wind gap and the delta erosion, let's say the different, the contrasting erosion between the reversed, which will be in red, and the beheaded in, 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 in blue. So at this moment, I am computing velocity of the wind gap as the based on the position of the wind gap in each time step. So in the first time step, I don't have velocity. However, the contrast in erosion is already very large. 
So as we will see, this will decrease exponentially. And this is because at the very next uh, time step after the, the, the river capture, uh, the contrasting erosion is really high, as I showed. So we have, we are moving forward in time and we can see now that this is uh, an ideal uh, morphology scenario for the wind gap to migrate. So every single time that we have a morphology such as this one, where the upper flat uh, part is very ample, ample, very, very large, I would say, uh, we have extremely uh, large velocities of wind gap migration. And I want to also point out at this moment that we have a very large differences between the differences in erosion in the two sides and how fast the wind gap is moving through in my model. So, and we will see this kind of dance of the morphology of the wind gap where it becomes uh, more steeper, meaning that the escarpment will be closer to the wind gap and that the flat part will be smaller and sometimes the other way around, which is a result of the wind gap moving faster or slower. And in a general sense, this is related to the proximity to a tributary that will be captured. So I'll keep moving, I'm checking the time. So, so now we can see already, we are getting closer to one of the big ones. And then we can see here, I will go back again, the steepening in the upper part. It's harder to see in such a scale before we were looking something between 500 to 600, now it's up to zero, but the steepening starts to happen. And then the, the reversed side will start to become, um, will start to become steeper. And the reason for that is because the velocity of the, the migration of the wind gap, which I, I am showing as this, this sphere, uh, slows down. And then the knee point is able to, to proceed further. And many times during this process, I, I don't know if I mentioned, uh, but probably you figure it out, the white spheres in, in, in these figures are knee points. And we can see that at each uh, capture, um, you, we, we create new, new knee points. So we are proceeding and then, okay, I will go forward a little bit for a, a larger capture. Yeah, this one. So when we are getting really close, the wind uh, to, to capturing a, a, a large tributary of the beheaded, the velocity of the wind gap will really slows down. And then this system will become steeper and steeper. And we can see that the beheaded becomes uh, ste uh, steeper as well in its upper part. And then the, the escarpment will reach the drainage divide up and this will increase the difference between the velocity of the wind gap and the, the contrast in erosion rates decrease and they get actually close uh, at this point. And the reason for that is because we don't have the flat, the flat part uh, in the first place. And after that, you have the capture and then you really increase the velocity of the wind gap once again. Yeah, and then we will reach uh, a condition uh, that is basically super uh, well adapted to be uh, progressing uh, really fast. So some insights at this point, I would say that the velocity of the, the wind gap varies. Uh, it's, it, it's very similar to what uh, Ethan Schleff and Lina Gordon describe it. So it, it uh, gets fast. It reduces its velocity, and it's usually associated with the proximity with the capture of a large tributary. Okay, and another thing that was important it was uh, th th there is one order of magnitude difference in the rates of the movement of the wind gap and the velocity and, and the cross divide uh, contrasting erosion, which is important. Uh, First, because it may help us understanding, um, for instance, in the case where we are playing with uh, cosmogenic data in escarpment, and we have very small differences in both sides. And yet, uh, sometimes we think that uh, the escarpment is moving at a much faster pace. For instance, this is one of the things we can think. At the same time, uh, if I use a geometric approach for estimating the rate of divide migration, such as this one that I am showing, in here, what we are seeing is that 
we there is a one way for us to estimate the velocity that the shared divide in time one we move horizontally to the position in time two using basically the differences in, in base uh, in, in average rates of surface lowering on the side one to the side two and you scale this to the, the two slopes on the two sides. We are treating this as a 1D problem. And this is very common uh, in, in, in works using, using erosion rates to get to retreat rates of escarpment, for instance, or drainage divide. And what is special here is that because when we have the configuration where we have the, the upper part super flat, when we scale this difference by a number that is very small, because if it's flat, this number will be very small, you have a very large uh, velocity through this method. And I can show that when I compare the two in here for all time steps of the model, um, they, they compare quite well. Uh, the, the, the large offsets, like in this point and this point, is usually, uh, you, you can see, is basically when you are getting close to one of these river captures, and then one side, the, the reverse side gets really steep. And at this point, you overestimate the velocity of the wind gap because the velocity is actually much smaller. But in general, they match really well, which is good news, for instance, when we are in the field and trying to measure um, the velocity, the, the whole, Velocities of horizontal mobility of drainage divides, for instance. Okay, so the insight here is that actually the flat morphology of this upper part is uh, helps amplifying the rates of horizontal divide movement, in the sense that even though the cross divide contrast in erosion rates are not that great, um, when we scale that by the the flat morphology. Uh, these wind gaps um, move through. And usually in the field, when we see uh, a wind gap configuration or, or a reversed behavior configuration where we have something like the WUTAC system, um, this wind gap is likely um, migrating really fast. And this is really important to us, for instance, because uh, I am inside of a project uh, here at the University of Tübingen, where the German government is trying to, to decide whether they will store their nuclear waste, and they want to understand how fast the escapement is retreating. And whatever the rates we measure, um, what this, this thing is saying to us is that the wind gap is moving much faster, and this will be very relevant to understand in this context. Another thing I want to mention is that the wind gaps can equilibrate at any point of a model run. They can equilibrate if they don't capture the behead, a behead tributary fast enough. They can equilibrate, equilibrate if uh, another river captures or experience base level lower, uh, lowering in the side opposite to the one that the wind gap is moving through and so on. So it can stop at any point, just as we've seen, for instance, this uh, stopping this escarpment right here is the same process. The base level fall migrated through the capture system and it, it balanced out the across divide differences in erosion rates, and that can always occur. Third thing I want to show is that <clears throat> sometimes, just have a little bit of water. Okay, what I want to say here is that this mechanism uh, is capable of creating, of preserving the antecedent drainage lines of the trunk stream of the tributaries, which we would call barbed tributaries. And the way this system works is really interesting because as the wind gap is moving through, it will capture first, let's say this first tributary here, and this would make a base level low, uh, lowering and create unique points in each one of these tributaries. But this is already losing area to the other side. So you end up with something that is 
almost nearly in, in its left side without um, channel length, let's say, but it, it was capable of uh, eroding to the right side, of expanding headwater to the right side. And how much this will expand to the right side is a function of when the wind gap or the base level lowering will reach the next big tributary to the right. So uh, that is a way for geometrically playing with the timings of all these different feedbacks. And I want to mention as well that um, in this case, when this, the, the wind gap captured this tributary, uh, it, it connected something that used to flow in a completely uh, different river system to the other side, the reversal core, and, and now it has also this part. And because the, the same way as I described it with the Bobby tributaries, so it created a base level fall that migrated through this entire system and was capable of stopping the migration of the escarpment to the other side. And because of that, it was capable of preserving the antecedent drainage line. Uh, in the left side, I am just showing a little bit of the su superposition of the original drainage network and the, the final one, except for the, the reverse ridge. And we can see that in, in many cases, we, we have had superposition, meaning that uh, you have some sort of preservation of these antecedent drainage lines uh, in cases where you have had a base level fault jump from one side that cancel uh, all the transients to the other. Okay, just now I will speak. I know that I will not have time to go through that too much, but I, I think it's worth mentioning that the mechanisms I am describing here can be scaled up to probably to the scale of a landscape. They are happening in different landscapes systematically, and perhaps even to a subcontinental uh, scale in case of um, scar big scarpments. For instance, we are looking at the Schwabian Alp, which I kind of described it. Uh, we have these nice escarpments, and they coincide with the exposure of hard limestone. And we can see the drainage divide in black. And we see that whereas in many cases, in several parts, the, the drainage divide is coinciding with the, the front of the escarpment, in other places, uh, the, the drainage divide is more inland, let's say. So you have something that is called we call embayments and spurs. So embayments and spurs. And in each of these embayments, uh, you have a river channel, a reversed river channel. And in this case, we cannot actually see the original capture point. It's not possible to extract that from the topography, but you have a reversed river channel, a beheaded channel, and then a, a, a wind gap, and then to the downstream part, a beheaded channel. One way to interpret this is to say that the movement of these wind gaps, which were very likely formed much downstream, are a main control to how the escarpment is retreating. And if that is the case, then understanding post capture landform development becomes really important because as I said, uh, if we think in terms of uh, a, a big escarpment, we are saying uh, that this can have subcontinental um, scale of impact. Okay, I will not have time actually to go through my sensitivity analysis. Um, I would need another presentation. This is more to describe the phenomenon and explain why, and to open for discussions and feedback to, to make you interested, I would say. But I, I want to mention that anything, that, any kind of parametrization, such as um, uh, increasing fluvial erodibility and so on, anything we do that enhances the erosion processes will make the wind gaps move faster or the drainage divides moving along the antecedent river valleys faster. And this is interesting because um, it is 
in this case, Elhana Harel and colleagues are describing um, very similar observations to the things I am describing, but in, in their case, they have a, a, a thin a cover of uh, alluvial material that has higher erodibility. And in this case, uh, the wind gap would move even faster. So I want to say that these are things that enhance the processes that I described. The other thing that is important is uh, this will happen with any uh, prescribed uplift rates, background uplift rates, meaning that in theory, this should occur uh, in, in tectonically active and inactive settings. And uh, in, in that scenario, when uh, uh, the, the, the uplift rate is lower than the background uplift rate, then the wind gaps dominate. Okay, uh, another thing that is really important is uh, the, perhaps the major control on how the, this process works in my models is the geometry of the antecedent river network. And so, and how it is related with the geometry of magnitude of transients. So to some extent, I want to emphasize that we have been perhaps uh, overlooking the role of the ge geometry of the river network. This is a major control of how a landscape evolving the aftermath of a capture event. Another thing that I'll mention, but uh, I know that it's not very wise of me to mention this because I don't want to, to enter in dispute is in my case, if I don't have any hue slope diffusivity, the process works the same. I'm not saying by that the hue slope diffusivity is not uh, important. Obviously, uh, I don't have enough resolution to deal with that in my model. Uh, but, and actually, uh, between the channel heads, we necessarily have hue slopes, and they should be evolving to um, creep and rain splash and so on. Um, and so we, there is need for better understanding and also other processes such as um, like avulsions along the lines of the wind gap because it is so low. Okay, all that is to say that even though when I describe as I did right now, it, this all sounds really straightforward. And I guess to some extent, easy to understand, but I can tell you that my journey to thinking through how this could have started from here and to the point where I have been now has been kind of something of discovery, which was really cool. This, this is what made me interested about geomorphology. Uh, in trying to understand the, the, the history of the landscapes and how they come to be as we can observe them. And so I really wish we can discuss this further and open for a really interesting scientific discussion. Please hit me up, uh, let's talk. And I, before I finish, as my last thing that I want to say is, I want to really thank uh, my, my colleagues here. They, Without their support, I would never be close to, to thinking these things because we think together and they are great. The second thing is I want to give a shout out to my, my colleagues in Brazil. It's, it's, uh, it's funny because uh, I know Pedro already presented in the Landscapes Live, but we are building something in Brazil with the Delta H meeting, and we are building a community of geomorphologists interested in approaching landscape evolution using quantitative tools. And for me to have this space, to have voice, and we are all represented. And we are having our meeting in Brazil soon. So I want to, to say, oh, let's go to Delta H. I think this will be great. And the third thing is for all um, my colleagues and friends, even the ones I, I don't know. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel. It was a very interesting talk. 
at least from my side. Really good. Um, so we do now have some time for questions, but I would also would like to remind you that we have um, some kind of a Discord channel in our Discord in Manscaped Live where we can, after the meeting, you can still post some questions to Daniel and then he can be updating and replying that forum. So do we have any questions for Daniel so far? Not yet. Oh, we do. Uh, from Sham Willett that is asking Daniel, what is the node spacing in your land lab model? Um, I tested, yeah, Sham, uh, please, please talk. We can have a chat. Hello? Hello. Is that gonna work? Perfect. Yes. Uh, we cannot hear you, Shane. Uh, now we can. I think that we cannot hear you very well. Maybe your internet connection is not really good. Could you reply, Daniel? Just Yeah, in this case, the one that I am showing right now is 200 meters. But I, I am playing with many different configurations. I would say. Good. I don't know if Sean wants to pose another question because she he wanted to talk. No. I would I would love to hear him. Okay. Do we have any other question from the audience? I actually have a follow-up while people might be uh, typing. Uh, or just a reminder, you can also raise your hand if you want uh, to ask the question directly so that we can uh, uh, unmute you. So Daniel, uh, so Sean mentioned uh, great spacing, but what about other parameters? Maybe uh, I think you're using the stream power loop to uh, simulate fluid erosion. What if you have a nonlinear stream power loop, for example, with n not equal to one when nick point will start eating each other, have you conducted sensitivity analysis on, on, on these parameters? I'm curious about, for example, how it would affect the way nick point are propagating more than the rate that will probably depend on that as well. Um, to be really honest, I already run it, the simulations, but I didn't analyze it then through. So I would not be able to really give you a, a good question, a good answer for that. Looking forward to hearing the results. Thank you. So, so there's a question uh, in the chat from Daniel Moreno. Hi, I wanted to know how did you estimate that the river capture occurred 18,000 years ago? Hi, Daniel. Thank you for your question. Uh, it was not really me. Uh, it was not really me. <laughs> so we have for our landscape in southwestern Germany. Um, Usually there is sedimentological data, which provide, for instance, I will give you an example. I don't know if I can show. Ah, no, I will not be able to. So uh, basically in, in the case of the Alpine Rhine, where the, the Rhine captured the Alpine and tributary they used to flow to the Danube, so they know that uh, about 1.5 million years ago, you start having uh, alpine contributions to the upper Rhine Graben, and you stop having uh, alpine contribution uh, at Ulm. So they can estimate the age using something like that. And for the, specifically for the Wutak, we have similar story with uh, age of deposits, uh, and they even grade to one side or the other. I think Sean is trying to. Yeah, I'm, I'm here again. Can I try again? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry. I hope my internet stays active here. 
Uh, so I'm curious, Daniel, yeah, that you've got the right figure up now. What, what the node spacing is on your model on the right frame here? It's 200 meters. And, and, and I'm wondering if you try doing the same thing at a reduced node spacing to see if your wind gap velocity was proportional to the node spacing. I, I ran it, but I didn't uh, analyze it yet, Shen. So I, I don't know. But this is really uh, something I should do. Yeah, if you, if you notice, in fact, when you compared your uh, model velocities with the slope, delta slope velocity, the model velocities have modes, right? You have the mm -hmm. same value, 700, 2400. They're, they're mm -hmm. very discrete and very exact numbers, right? And what that's, what that's indicating is that the uh, wind gap is jumping nodes one by one, boom, 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 right? And it's doing mm -hmm. it with a particular frequency and that's why you get exact numbers. And that typically means that you're really dealing with numerical effects at that point. And I, I would check that very carefully to see if you actually are accurately calculating the divide velocity or if it's just kind of a no jumping phenomenon. Okay, thank you. This is, this is really nice and I would do it. Okay, any other questions? No, oh, we do. Um, it's from Ethan Shelleft. Thank you for a fascinating talk. You mentioned the asymmetric geometry of the captured tributaries in the model. Do you also see this pattern in natural settings? Thank you, Ethan. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, in the Sheridan Alp, we see exactly the same configuration as the one I described it. In, and we have so many different uh, Bavia tributaries. And actually, uh, one of the postdocs in our group is developing a geometric approach to trying to get uh, ages from the geometry of the Bavi tributaries. But yes, we do see. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> My, I hope it's not really silly. Uh, um, how could we improve the inclusion of the ante antecedent geometry networks in the model? Is that possible or um, it's to find how to do it? Mm. If possible, of course. Yeah, I think like I, I am de developing something where I can kind of control um, how the geometry looks like. And I am testing it through in various scenarios. I am playing right now, I, I am studying a Cuesta landscape. And I think that the, the geometry of the plateau side is really important. And yes, I am playing with that, but other than you really forcing it and testing it through, I don't know. Any other questions? No, don't be shy. Or if you have any other questions, you can keep on going on Discord. Pedro, you I'll, want to say something? I'll just jump in. I'll, I'll uh, thank uh, Daniel for um, giving this presentation and um, yeah, helping us think a little bit more deeply about the wind gap migration processes. Um, I was wondering if you have um, thought about you know how are how potentially we can measure these things in the field with uh, uh, trying to collect erosion rates because one of the things we do, as you showed, is we will go to either side and measure erosion rates on the escarpments and try to constrain wind gap migration or or divide migration that way. So, what have you thought about ways to potentially um, get empirical uh, uh, evidence of of the wind gap migration, or is this something that we have to sort of infer from from modeling? Um, so I have been playing with many scenarios, and I am measuring like differences in erosion rates in many different ways, like first pixel, one kilometer, and blah blah blah. Many different ways, and uh, I am comparing to 
the observations. I would say uh, probably collecting upstream, really upstream, because you if you, if I only take uh, the differences in erosion rates uh, of the the escarpment, the scarp part, the steep part, I overestimate. Whereas if I only grab what is just uh, in the flat part, in, in a flat uh, wind gap configuration, I underestimate. So usually grabbing a little bit of both, a little bit downstream, but not too much, because if you go too much, then he, at least in my case, the, the very downstream area is eroding at uh, the same rate as the background uplift. So yeah, I would say upstream, but not too upstream. But this is something I am working on. And because we have so many in the landscape I am studying, um, this is something we are playing with. And in our case, I collected in, for most of our wind gaps in the Shravian Alp, I collected uh, sediments in both sides, limestone pebbles, and we are estimating uh, chlorine 36 erosion rates from those. So yeah, I hope I can have a, a good answer soon enough. Okay. Um... In case we don't have more, more questions, thank you so much, Daniel. Again, it was really a really nice talk. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you to Boris. Thank you to Pedro for also helping to moderating the talk. And thanks to everyone that attended. It was really nice to have you all here. Uh, don't forget that you can keep the discussion in this core channel. Boris already placed the, the, the address there, so you can easily access to it. And bye, everyone. Thank you.